Hello, hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 823rd New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Aitak Dibovar, Shokufe Desfouli, Katayun Keshavorsi, and Morishin Alayari. We're thrilled to welcome poet Persis M. Karim here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guests and host. Aitak Dibavar is an Iranian activist, artist, and professor of gender and social justice at McMaster University in Canada. Aitak's work and research are entangled with feminist, queer, decolonial, and anti-racist knowledge production as well as creative art-based teaching practices. Shokufe Desfli is an Iranian artist and writer based in Pennsylvania. Her work centers around transnational feminism, community care, and the pursuit of ecological and social justice. Shokufe aims to shed light on the intricate power dynamics present in social structures with the goal of sparking conversations and inspiring transform transformative action. Katayun Keshavorsi was born in Iran in 1980 and moved to Sweden in 2009. Since then, Katayun has started a publishing company and worked as an interpreter, translator, and teacher, among other things. Through the years, Katayun has been politically active as an intersectional feminist, especially on social media, analyzing and discussing issues related to politics, gender, inequalities, and human rights. And Morshin Aliyari is a New York-based Iranian Kurdish artist using 3D simulation, video, sculpture, and digital fabrication as tools to refigure myth and history. Through archival practices and storytelling, her work weaves together complex counter-narratives in opposition to the lasting influence of Western technological colonialism in the context of Swana. Her work has been part of numerous exhibitions, festivals, and workshops at venues around the world. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to Morshin. Thank you so much, Chloe, and um, also Brooklyn Braille. Um, I am honored to be here with um, some of my, my favorite um, inspiration uh, in ways that they've been thinking, writing, uh, organizing around feminism. I also wanna give my thanks to Brooklyn Braille for hosting this series. This is our last um, session, the, our last event of this, this series. We started the first one in March and uh, I've learned a lot. And I hope that that also has been an experience for um, other people who've like participated. But this is, I wanna say that it will be an ongoing practice, I think for a lot of us who are here. Um, and so if you're interested in what you hear today, follow us for all our work. Um, and yeah, I hope that we can continue building these spaces together. So I want to start from um, kind of reading a very short paragraph uh, that is from Begu Collective, um, a collective of um, a small group of Iranian feminists uh, of how they define transnational feminism. Uh, which is that it's a solidarity based, uh, it's a feminism that is solidarity based on oppressions that women and marginalized groups experience in different geopolitical contexts. This sense of solidarity is rooted in recognizing plurality and diversity of lived experiences shaped by various factors uh, such as race, ethnicity, class, sexual orientation, and age and not the idea of a universal sisterhood or shared biological characteristics among women. Rather than relying on the notion of a uniform global patriarchy, transnational feminism draws attention to how other structures, such as capitalism, imperialism, racism, religious fundamentalism, etc., intersect with patriarchy and create multiple social realities worldwide. 
um, I thought maybe also this would be helpful kind of to bring us in like a same page about the ways that we're thinking about well, some of the ways that we're thinking about this idea of um, transnational feminism. And I thought I would start today's um, event with a little bit of a casual personal setting and, and, and question. Um, and I wanted to ask each of you uh, if you could perhaps um, think about a story um, that, you know, when, when you hear the word feminism or gender equality, um, is there like a moment, a day, an incident that you can think about that was instrumental in your interest in, in feminism? Um, do, you, do you have a story like that that you wanna, you wanna share with us? Anyone can, can start. Yes. Okay. So yeah, thank you, um, first of all, Chloe, for that um, introduction, and Marisha and John, thank you, and everyone at Brooklyn Rail um, for all of your work creating this series, um, and thank you for including me in this conversation today. I'm really glad and excited um, to be in conversation with you, um, Marisha, Katayun, Aitak, and everyone else, uh, to be honest. And um, I, I am seeing familiar names in the um, in the audience. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I would say that um, my journey toward feminism, I think it wasn't an instant revelation. You know, it took time for me, maybe more than a decade um, to really understand um, its meaning and its relevance. Um, I grew up in an environment and among women who were keen on the subject of women's rights and were against fixed um, gender norms. But when I first encountered the idea of feminism itself, it still seemed like a um, like an abstract and distant theory, you know, and it, and it felt very individualistic, very foreign and quite honestly, not really appealing. Um, but I think it was during my time as a new immigrant uh, in grad school, confused here in the, in the US, um, it was when that I began to look at feminism more as a framework, as a um, way to understand, understand my, you know, my position and my positionality within these new, structures, new societal structures and power dynamics that I was trying to understand uh, very hard and um, in relation to the systems of oppression that affected my life before the immigration and after the immigration. Um, so I started exploring and working with the notion of feminism um, through my art practice. Um, yeah, and I always say that art and immigration kind of brought me, you know, my my experience of immigration brought me um, to feminism. Um, and, and, and I think there is one other layer to it when it comes to um, intersectional feminism. And um, funny enough, I feel that my um, engagement later on with animal liberation and climate crisis was actually very fully grasped the real meaning of intersectional feminist activism and the urgency of it, you know, understanding uh, these connections between um, different forms of oppression and understanding um, the impact of, you know, those systems, the patriarchal and the anthropocentric, you know, the structures um, on both human and non-human animals. Um, yeah, and that, that was when I realized that feminism wasn't just about gender equality and more about, you know, how, how these systems of domination work together um, to, um, you know, affect different, basically, spheres of life. Yeah, so that's, that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I, I want to definitely at some point come back to the work that you do that connects these notions of, um, you know, feminism, uh, also like decolonial ways of understanding our relationship to space, to land, um, but also, you know, um, anti, 
yeah, anti-oppressive ways of understanding our relationship to to other species, right? So um, hopefully, like we can at some point like circle back because I would love you to share like a little bit more about about the work that you do around us. Of course, thank you, um, Catherine John. Would you would you mind sharing? Of course, uh, thank you everyone for the introduction, for inviting me. Um, thank you, Shikufa, for um, what you said. It's amazing how similar uh, experiences we have sometimes. Uh, for me as well, it hasn't been just one incident. It's been a whole process and it's been like a chain of incidents. But I think the seeds were planted when I was um, in a transition from being a child to a teenager and a puberty. And I remember how uh, the public places were taken away from me as a child and how my brothers got to go outside with their friends and I was bound to be at home. And the in interesting thing for me was that from the very beginning, it wasn't only the gender because we were living in a poor neighborhood and my parents had registered me at uh, a school in a rich neighborhood and then I realized how our freedoms were different because they had access to like telephones, those times, you know, when there was still telephones, we didn't have access to telephone line. They had like the families had cars, so they had like more freedom to move. And I think the seeds were planted already then when I realized that, okay, in the beginning it was the gender. And then I realized, okay, it's not only the gender, but when it comes to gender and the class, then it gets really harder to grasp and to compare. And it was really hard for me to explain this to my rich friends. And it was hard to explain the experiences I had with the rich friends, with my poor friends, because there was this gap and nobody would understand each other's world. So, and then when I immigrated to see, then there was another aspect of that and it was this aspect of being an immigrant and see how supremacy and racism uh, affect you so all these intersections that you year by year are exposed to and you learn and then you have to unlearn and then you have to have a soul searching so it's been a long long way for me as well Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing that. And the same as I was mentioning with Sugar, it's always interesting how other um, other topics, other components come in, right? Like you speaking about class as something that perhaps usually is not like really delved into from this like very like specific like positioning of it. Uh, also in the context of Iran, which uh, you know that that experience itself like you know changes because the class dynamics are different than something that like maybe people would experience let's say in the us so um yeah would love to also come back to this topic of class as well at some point thank you so much and i thank you absolutely um first of all it's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you thank you broken rail for providing this platform and thank you morshin for doing this amazing and very important work of bringing, bringing these conversations together and making them audible. Um, I also want to thank you, Chloe, for the introduction. I just want to say that I, as an, as an Iranian um, lawyer and feminist activist in exile, I've, for the past 14 years, I've been living, working, and studying and teaching on the lands of the Erie, Neutral, Grand Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas of the New Credit people. And I'm forever grateful for the love and care that has gone um, to this lands. Um, when I heard of the question the first time, it just kind of reminded me of um, Bell Hooks, that very famous quote from Teaching to Transgress that she says, I came to theory from pain. I came to theory because I was hurting because the pain was so too, so intense that I could not go living um, living out without it and and this question kind of brought me brought that to my mind that I obviously I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone on this panel and everyone here but it for me hearing Katayun and hearing Shikufe um, kind of feels like similarly I um, 
like these um, experiences that are already shared, I came to, I came to theory um, from pain um, because I was because I was searching because I was hurting because I was trying to find the vocabulary vocabulary and the ways to put into words or make sense of what was happening um, around me. Um, and similarly, it was not just a one woman moment for me, but it was accumulation of multiple moments coming together as an Iranian femme who do, does identify as gender nonconforming, who has lived under religious theocracy and cis heteropatriarchy, as someone who has survived domestic violence and abusive relationship, as an exilee who lives on Turtle Island uh, and constantly hears and knows about, let's say, the 300 um, um, unresolved cases of missing and murdered indigenous women and everything that similarly comes with the experience of being in an exile, being in a different society, different culture, and being subjected to so many other layers of experiences of not just being an Iranian femme, not just being a queer, not just being um, an exilee, not just having to kind of um, grapple with all these like uh, other experiences of that comes with not by being from here or also being a refugee settler on a settler colonial land. And all of that has brought me um, to feminism or at least um, to intersectional, decolonial and transnational feminism that kind of allowed me um, to grapple with all these experiences and trying to make sense of them and trying to, uh, very similar to what Shukufa said, find the framework to kind of say, okay, here are the things that are happening to me, but also here are the things that are happening around me and how our experiences are connected and different. Um, so in that way, I think um, coming to feminism for me also took maybe a decade, more than a decade, probably almost a two decade to come into it and say, okay, now I feel like I have found a location for me to kind of help me, help me give the terminology for me to kind of, uh, to put into words these experiences um, and also connect the I to kind of the we around us and, and, and finding the way and the context for it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I think it's kind of this naturally like actually like brings us to the second question because of, you know, again, um, what, thinking about feminism as, as uh, both Ithac and Shofa, you both also talk about this like framework, right? Um, and I think a framework that is is has the potential or is or is big enough as an umbrella to include many other topics and ways you know that that we want to connect these different forms of like oppression it's not just oppression only toward like women bodies it's oppression to other as we said like species or other um you know um it's oppression toward queer bodies it's oppression toward trans bodies etc um so um when you think about i guess like this this word of transnational feminism um, I kind of was interested to learn from each of you why, in your opinion, it's important for feminism to be transnational. Why? Why is it that there is, there has been, you know, it, like even the fight that we've been wanting to have, or like especially, I feel like I'm, I will talk about myself personally, like since um, September 2022 uh, with the killing of Jinam Hasamini. Um, and everything that has been like unfolding, I remember especially the first like three, four months of it, um, that there was this, um, you know, I call it like shocking, but also not shocking silence from the feminisms of the global north, especially around what was happening in Iran. I almost couldn't like believe it for like a month as weeks would unfold, um, even people around me, people that I would think that they care about, like something that is happening. But for example, this what was happening and unfolding in Iran, I feel like it felt like something that was happening in another part of the world. Something that was there was a distance. Oh, it's it's happening there. It's not part of our problems or our like day to day life or something that we should like you know go out of our way to like show concern about. Um, and for me, that this was like a very important moment to recognize the failure of feminism when it comes to transnational feminism when it comes to uh, in, in this, you know, Western feminism, when it comes to like actually like understanding really what it means to build in, um, 
inter intersectional uh, and internationalist frameworks, right? Um, so I want to kind of hear your thoughts um, about about this experience, perhaps, but also about um, why do you think it matters for us to work towards uh, a feminism that is uh, in transnational. I can jump in, if that's all right. Um, Maura Xinjiang, that's an incredibly important and complex question, um, and also a difficult one, you know, because as you said, it is, it is also personal. And I feel from my own experience and talking to other folks, I feel this topic really kind of gets under our skin to be honest, and um, on a personal level, I'm still crushed, you know, since last September, I'm still heartbroken um, by the silence and um, lack of communication I receive from people I know, you know, I know here from um, the people that I call my community in the, in the US regarding the situation of Iran. And I feel that this, um, lack of support that many of us felt actually became a source of conversation and sparked you know discussions around this leftist anti-imperialist spaces that we were expecting to hear from um and all of us i feel in this space um we all talked about this in our online spaces in our offline spaces about the meaning of this lack of support you know from leftist organizations and individuals um, we all talked about the dangers, you know, of remaining silent about the atrocities of Iranian regime. Um, and there was a lot of talk, you know, that these groups um, were afraid of aligning with Islamophobic notions. And, uh, and of course, it's not just this, you know, we also, I think, need to um, follow the money um, if we want to know who shapes, you know, who really shapes the discourse. Um, and in many instances, unfortunately, the leftist organizations can be funded directly or indirectly by the Iranian regime or its allies. Um, so we've been talking about these issues uh, for a while. And unfortunately, um, sometimes it can feel as if we are, I don't know, shouting into the wind. But I, I feel there is also a positive and productive um, side to this in terms of um, prompting self-reflection within the Iranian diaspora, you know, because many of us, I feel, started looking at ourselves and our knowledge or lack of knowledge, you know, of other struggles. For example, it's been more than 12 years since the Arab Spring, right? But how many of us really took the time to ask our Arab sisters and non-binary siblings about their experiences, you know, how many of us even read about the legacy of people's struggles in Latin America. And I'm not um, trying to imply that this solidarity is a, uh, like a transaction. It's not like I give you solidarity, you give me solidarity, but I think if we, um, if we really want to be able to be in real solidarity with people, um, and I'm saying this to myself and to the Iranian community in diaspora, first and foremost, we need to get to know people and not the media narrative of them, you know, but rather really sit with people, talk with people to understand them, and especially those who are from different histories and different backgrounds. Um, so, Going back to your question, Martin John, about the importance of having transnational and internationalist framework, I think by talking to people, we start to um, recognize the, the commonalities of a struggle among uprisings around the world. We realize that there is this kind of shared vision for a better world. And um, and again, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to imply that we are fighting one tyranny. There are multiple tyrannies that are absolutely connected. And um, it makes you think that how can we even imagine um, the emancipation of Iran without talking about the struggle of people in like 
Sudan, in Syria, in Palestine, you know, and these are these are important subjects that we need in the community in the of Iranian diaspora to talk about. Um, and I just like to add one more note. Um, I'm really interested to see what Catherine and ITAC have to say, but um, I want to add this that this transnational nature of our problems that shouldn't erase our differences. And I think we need to focus on that. We actually need to pay a lot of attention to our differences and the different, you know, um, geopolitical contexts and histories that shape each, each struggle. Um, so last week I saw a picture. Uh, I hope Chloe can send the link um, to everyone. Um, it was circulating online of Israel's women soldiers. And the picture caption was true feminism, Israeli style. And um, it was a brilliant comment on it by another user saying, yes, equal opportunity to commit genocide against the Palestinian people, you know? So when we talk about feminism today, I feel that we really need to be careful and we really need to be aware of ways that concepts like feminism can be abused and co-opted, you know, by fascism, by neoliberalism, and any other system of oppression that um, use these kind of concepts to push and further their own agendas. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. There are so many amazing points. Um, I, you know, especially I feel like um, one thing that I personally have learned in the last few years is that um, we, like growing up in Iran, I think we, we read so much more of the literature, the theories, the books and material of the global north compared to the global south. Um, I went to Tehran University to the, um, you know, I was, I was in the social science department and we were obsessed by the white Western men theorists, you know, that's all we studied through my whole like college, like four years of college, like literally on media theories. Um, not that there is like that many other media theories out there that are not in this demographics, but there are other voices and other experiences. But I feel like for me personally, it also has taken like a lot of unlearning to look for, you know, to his histories, stories, experiences that are um, not the dominant narrative uh, that is like out there and available like easily. Um, so I, like kind of like doing the work of like digging and finding similar stories, especially again, because of um, many other like shared struggles that is kind of closer to each other. When you think about Global South, um, I found so much power in interweaving these these experiences so yeah you're absolutely right about that and thanks for bringing that up okay um who else wants to go i can go um agreeing with everything that shikupa said i felt like i've just whatever whatever you must mention shikupa john it just felt like this was also a lot of it has uh what i've experienced what i've seen um let me start by saying that, Martian John, thank you for that question. I feel like initially when the Jena revolution started and in, in the first few months of it, I was angry. I was like viscerally angry at not circles that I wasn't expecting, um, like not the circles that were on my own or at least that I felt belonged to. Um, I mean, not angry at the other circles, but the circles that I belong to. I felt like I was angry at leftists, um, and progressive, um, post-colonial, decolonial, intersectional feminists that were completely quiet on this issue. And I was trying to wrap my head around like where are these silences are coming from? Um, and uh, like, I remember just like, yelling at people on Instagram and in different podcasts. And like, I felt like I was just like bridging, like uh, kind of breaking all the bridges one by one behind my back, but like wrecking everything. But I was, I was fuming. And for me, I felt like I was fuming because I find that I, for me, at least like I, I, I felt like the silences were coming, like they were in kind of two folds. And obviously these are not kind of clear differentiation between them. It's just, some sort of like, I don't know, analytical taxonomy for me to make sense of the silences that were happening. Um, 
I felt like the one group of people who didn't talk on these issues, kind of, I kind of refer to them as people who do the, the, the anti-imperialism of the fools. And this is not my phrasing. This is actually a phrasing by a Syrian activist who wrote a letter a couple of years ago, really angry at the same progressive circles that we are angry at, saying that um, because they found themselves in the same situation, wherever they were criticizing Bashar Assad, everyone was in the critical, not everyone, the certain group of people in these circles were saying, well, you're buying into the imperialist narratives, like you, sh like you sh cannot do that. Whatever you're saying can be co-opted by neocons and whatever, which yes, right? But then she, like the people who wrote this letter was saying, well, then then what? Then what, what else, what kind of other platforms do we have to say it? And I felt like extending that to the context of Iran. There are certain people who see Iran, be it Iranian or non-Iranian, actually the majority are non-Iranian, that see Iran as this like code and code, and I'm really, I'm, I just want to emphasize that I'm putting it in code as an anti-imperialist imperialist force because it is code and code is standing up to America, right? And defining standing up very loosely over here. Um, and then for the virtue of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, they don't, and they don't want to really go ahead and criticize anything that the Iranian government does to a point that they actually silence the voices that are coming within the Iranian community or from Iran that are the, that are the voices of the dissensus, right? So I think that was part of it, that there was that part of it. And there was another part of it that I think Shikha Fabrillian mentioned, which is the, the, the fear of from the people who weren't um, not particularly agreeing with the Iranian government or, uh, or, or considering Iran as an anti-imperialist force, but they were scared that whatever they can they say might perpetuate Islamophobia. And of course, Islamophobia does exist. And of course, many of us go through life experiencing the material implications of Islamophobia. So there's no denial of that, right? But the context matters over here. Um, the power dynamics matter. The people who they were saying, oh, like, look, these women are burning a job, but these women weren't burning a job in the streets of Toronto or in New York. They were burning a job in Iran under a religious dictatorship that had oppressed them, disciplined them, punished them, murdered them for the past 45 years. So our analysis should go back to the context. So context should become important when we are saying, well, something that there's, that this might be perpetuating Islamophobia, yes. But the context of this conversation is very different. And also what type of a feminist are we if we are not actually talking about for choice and agency? Like we, we at, I mean, we stand as we should behind, for example, women who are going against Bill C-21 in Quebec right now that are banning women to wear a job, right? We should stand by those women who wants to wear a job because that's, that's their own body, that they, have, they should have sovereignty over their own body. But also we can, in the same way and in the same breath, stand with the people in Iran who also want to have the same sort of choice and agency and sovereignty over their body that they've been lacking for the past 45 years. So if these two, they, 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 and, and my engagement with these two kind of silences were different because I I'm very much willing to sit down and talk with and explain the context to people who were silent because they were afraid they were perpetuate Islamophobia. But I have lost my patience with the anti-imperialists, the fools. Like I have, I have lost my patience and I think they have done so much damage in the past that um, it's really hard to kind of um, recover some sort of, I don't know, um, communication between us. I don't know, ask me in a couple of years, I might, I might have calmed down and like be in better states to talk about this, but for now I'm really mad. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, a lot that you mentioned that I've, you just did a great job also kind of bringing a couple of points that I feel like has gotten lost sometimes in understanding these contexts for people who might not have that context or understand it in, in, a, in a way that you put within the you know history of Islamic uh, Republic and the way that women's body have been always a, a battle, right? For like political, um, political battle, basically. Um, and I'm gonna go to Katayun now. Uh, we, we're, I, I wanna make sure we get to our next like two questions, but uh, yeah, please Katayun share with us your thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you, Morshinjan. Uh, brilliant question. I think 
uh, I feel the frustration uh, that Aitak and Shikufa were talking about. I mean, it, I've, I've been so frustrated. And I've been just writing article after article and trying to persuade the leftists in Sweden. And I've been lectured about Islamophobia, although we are uh, the ones that are against Islamophobia. I think you have uh, summarized this and explained it brilliantly, both of you. Uh, the only thing that I want to add to this is this, that what we see are different sides of white feminism. And uh, it has like two sides. <clears throat> one side has to do with cultural relativism and one has to do with culture absolutism. So one, one side of white feminist feminism is like, okay, is there culture down there? Uh, the compulsory hijab is the culture and we have nothing to do with that. These are the people that are allied with uh, the anti-amps, the anti-imperialists. And then on the other side, we have that kind of white feminism that says that, okay, we have a better patriarchy than you. Than you. Our patriarchy is better than your patriarchy. And we are the saviors. We're going to save you if you just ally yourself with the right, with the Trump, with the neocons. So both are white, white feminists to me. And they have this reductionist cultural analysis that they explain everything with the culture without thinking about the laws, the infrastructure. I mean, talking about compulsory hijab as culture is a betrayal to all women because it doesn't have anything to do with culture. It's the laws that we are against. And as you, Aitak, mentioned, it's about agency. It's about the freedom of choice. Uh, and also the one thing about this white feminism is that if I, as a feminist, a POC feminist in Sweden at least, if I don't have to fight racism, then I will be able to do a lot more with feminism. I mean, if uh, everyone can be a white feminist, I can be a white feminist in the context of the Arab women in Iran, the Kurdish people in Iran. So white fem feminism is not that I'm white, it's how I look at the world. So if white feminists really want to help us, the best way is to be anti-fascists and anti-racists in the first place, so that we get the energy, the time, the space to do what we are going to do. And that's talking about the context of Sweden, I see. It's not strange that the transphobia is expanding here in Sweden. It's this white feminism that sees everything biologically and in an essentialist way. So you are um, Iranian, that's biological. If you're a woman, you're biological. These things are associated together. They work together. They have the same mechanisms and they have the same goal. I think it's very important to mention exactly transphobia when it comes to uh, the matter of racism, the matter of white feminism, and how the white feminists are allying with us, because I have discussed and discussed and discussed with leftist men who know very much better than me that if I talk about compulsory hijab, then it's absolutely Islamophobia. I'm not going to repeat myself anymore. I'm tired of that. I mean, how many articles are we going to write? How many discussions, panel discussions are we going to have? At the end of the day, I think we have to talk about what we want and what kind of feminism do we want? The communities around the world. Have we, I mean, we as Iranians, have we talked about Iraq? Have we talked about Sudan? As Shukufa mentioned, where are we in that equation? So for me, the most important thing is to distance myself from, I don't mean the white feminists, but the white feminism as this perspective.
Yeah, absolutely. And I think you started mentioning, um, thanks to all of you for this, there's so much to think about. Um, and Kathleen, you started mentioning kind of some of the things that are like action based work that can be done, um, you know, beyond just discussing, um, I think, um, with I know, for example, ITAC, you have been uh, working in like kind of like through like education, uh, thinking about courses, thinking about, um, you know, spaces like higher education, colleges, schools, et cetera, as ways that this conversation can start. But I want to kind of, um, you know, if we can just list some of the things, you know, people, you, when, whenever this conversation comes, I've had people sometimes asking, okay, what can you tell us? Like, what are the things that we can do that are like tangible actions? Uh, so I wanted to kind of ask if any of you can throw some of these ideas or actions. It can be smaller actions. It can be bigger, bigger, like maybe things that require a little bit of more in-depth work. Um, but I would appreciate any kind of thoughts or suggestions around that. I can jump in. Please. If that's okay with you people. <laughs> Uh, I think I've repeated myself many times when it comes to this. Probably my friends have heard it many times, but I'm going to say that again anyway, because I think we're really hurt by the neoliberal logic and the public management, new public management logic. So we want to measure everything and we want to see the effect of what we do directly. And the larger, the better, the faster, the better, the bigger, the better. So it's like this grandiose perspective that we are either going to, I don't know, dismantle patriarchy, demolish patriarchy or do nothing. So uh, for me, when the Gina revolution began, I mean, my only wish when I went to the university was that somebody would carry my backpack for me between the classes or somebody would buy me a cup of coffee you know I was so tired and I appreciated that when I was giving a speech somewhere it was raining and somebody just held the umbrella to me these are the acts of solidarity because we have to think about the division of labor here as well my allies my white allies they got all the places and spaces to make speeches Meanwhile, we were cleaning and doing labor, uh, emotional labor in the backstage. So for me, it's the things that are maybe little, if you look at it with the perspective of, you know, the, uh, the patriarchal paternalistic that you have to do very great things, you have to be a hero. But I want the roles not to be predefined in that way. I mean, solidarity comes in many forms and it doesn't have to be measured and it doesn't lead directly to the demolition of the regime in Iran, but just acting of care work and uh, emotional labor. I think these are very important for us. There were many people who were like they were demonstrating every week and they had nobody to take care of their children or uh, they didn't have the time because they worked after the work they were demonstrating they couldn't uh, make food for themselves so these are really important things i would say in uh, solidarity actions Um, I can follow on that. Catherine John, thank you so much for bringing um, the action part of the solidarity. You know, I think it's very important. And I, and I, I was also thinking about how do we um, even define solidarity, you know, because I feel these days when you hear the word solidarity, you know, basically any context it feels like it's a feeling and a concept you know and not an active practice and I think we really need to change that um and you talked about your experience after the Gina um, uprising and I want to follow on that because um I feel many of us have started connecting um many people in this um, various space be connected because of what happened uh, after the Gina uprising. And, you know, a lot of small and big feminist collectives have formed 
um, some of them more Xinjiang you had conversations with, you know, in this in this very series, which is without a doubt a crucial step forward. Um, but there's also this feeling that I have that we are still lacking structures, you know, there is a lot of talk about solidarity, but there's not a lot of work being done on collective and organizational level. And um, my stress is uh, on the organizational part of it. So what I find really necessary um, for our kind of next step in the diaspora is starting coalitions, you know, among networks and collectives. We are all, you know, these, uh, we have all these amazing collectives, but we need to connect those collectives and make, make coalitions. Um, and also, again, to repeat myself, I feel we need to do this across different movements, you know, with different uh, nations. Um, so, yeah, I think creating more uh, groups, more organizations, more spaces that are multinational, I think it, it is very necessary to do that with our Arab um, and Afghan and Kurd siblings, you know, here in the, in the diaspora. And, I feel that we need to get to the details, you know, to the like nitty gritty of the situation and ask difficult questions, you know. For example, the question of language barrier is always there. We have to think about that. How can we overcome, you know, our linguistic shortcomings? How can we invite more people into our collective networks? How can we work with um, folks from different, as I said, backgrounds, different languages? toward a, you know, a shared goal. And um, I feel it's in the process of doing this kind of work and not just talk, you know, the praxis, the praxis itself. Um, it is when people's consciousness is kind of lifted and real solidarity is formed. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine John and Shifu Bajanari. Thank you both both what you have offered is, is great. I'm listening, I'm re agreeing, I'm kind of learning in the process as well. And I'm, and I'm reflecting on, on what you're saying. And I think I 100% uh, on both the aspect of the care that Catherine Jung, you mentioned that uh, from our allies, a simplistic, really like micro things that people could have done and can still do to support us in this process. I remember, like just requesting from the people in the and around me saying just just check in like simple things just ask how are you doing like how are you surviving this just like how are you because as you were saying in in a very kind of um capitalistic frame of pro like productivity that you always have to like you're always on the go whenever you're asking like what are you doing they're counting on like the 17 things that are there have to on the go like I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm publishing this, I'm publishing that. It's just very simple thing of just like asking, no, how are you actually feeling, right? And I think that that the people who did that and the people who continue to do that, I felt a genuine kind of care from coming, coming from that end. And that for me at that moment, at least meant a minimal act of solidarity to just like take a time in, in of your day to just ask how are you doing like how, how like you're sitting here today but I know like your your heart and soul and your like body is somewhere else right so from that to like uh, what also what is happening over here right now in a platform that Broken Rail shared with us and further platforms that can be created right that a place for us as an Iranian women queer poor um folks with disability that we can we can come together and imagine a future otherwise. Like, I don't think we actually had big opportunities to actually think of what do we want for our future? Like, what is, what is that we desire for our future, right? I mean, majority of the conversations always often is occupied by like raw, raw nationalism of, or like centrist conversations of what a future of whatever Iran is gonna look like, or a very kind of violent conversations or on like borders and, and like, uh, or like, the, the topic of like monarchy versus this 
presidency versus that, whether like a basic acknowledgement of um, what people who are always kind of pushed to the margins of our society would want from a future for themselves. And I do feel, and I'm usually not a very hopeful person, but I, I wanna say a hopeful note. And I, and I think because of the slogan, and because of how this movement have started, the Jinjian Azadi slogan, who, which was a like a slogan, uh, a Kurdish slogan that has emerged as a response to the state-sponsored violence against Kurdish women in Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, and 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 how soon it became a chant for liberation for Kurdish women against both patriarchy, state-sponsored uh, uh, oppression, but and, and also socioeconomic structures embedded within the capitalist system. I feel like the slogan in and of itself created this like dynamic for further conversation and alternative thinking. And I'm not saying everywhere, but at least I felt like the margin is expanding a little bit so that these conversations can be are becoming a little more audible and we are not constantly being like pushed to the back and and being asked to like shut up because other people meaning cis men are going to be in charge and elite cis men are going to be in the charge of pay, like thinking or imagining what our future is going to look like so in that to that slogan and how this movement has started i feel like there is that act of like solidarity happening among groups who were again not romanticizing, but saying that potentiality has been created. And I think that potentiality lends itself for us to like take it and then try to find different platforms. And as Shukuba was saying, coming together, finding ways of connecting our struggles together to actually think about the future of Iran beyond what has already constantly been talked about before. Um, and I have one more thing. I don't know what we are doing on time, but I wanted to mention like Katarina Jones, um, you posted something, a story, I think a couple of days ago. And I wanted to kiss the story if we can actually kiss a story. Um, and it's it, it made a correlation between nationalism and, um, and, and, and rape culture and sexual assaults, like nationalistic rhetoric in that. And for me, that, that's exactly what this slogan has offered us to rethink and think about, right? To, to remember that patriarchy is connected to imperialism, connected, deeply rooted in capitalism, connected in the nationalistic rhetoric. And we cannot think of an alternative future as feminists if we are not taking all of this into account. And a true solidarity emerges from acknowledging all these different layers that are embedded within patriarchy, right? And that's, yeah, that's all I have to say. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. I kind of wanted to, um, we, we have to move to questions uh, from audience soon, but I wanted to kind of, um, yeah, bring also this back um, to something that Shukufe mentioned with the previous question which was that one thing at least that, um, you know, in some of the collectives that I've been involved, we've been thinking about is um, translation, like doing translation work that is about um, kind of translating or mm, somehow like sharing stories of his histories of other revolutions in again, global South or like feminist movements or other, any, any other forms of like uprising um, as, yeah, like translating them to Farsi as a context, again, that might not have been like thought through from these like very specific lenses. So, you know, we're talking about how others outside of borders of Iran, how others might be able to like, you know, participate, how we can build spaces for ourselves in the diaspora. But I also feel like there is another side of this, which is that there's so much to, as Shokufe said, to learn from other histories, right? So like doing translation work, being able to kind of um, somehow, again, like I, I really think for me personally, um, always like reading things or like learning about something has like played such an important role in completely shifting something that I never knew about or always also being like, right, like open to this like idea of growth and um, 
yeah, learning from from other experiences. So I do feel like I really appreciate people that um, in this since the especially the Jinar revolution have been doing a lot of translation work. Um, not only language was, but translation of something going from one culture to another culture. Um, I was recently also reading um, this um, book, parts of this book by Angela Davis, in which she goes um, to uh, Egypt to do work with feminists in, in Egypt. And she's looking for frameworks that make sense in the context of, again, going from America, um, obviously her being involved for many, many years, um, you know, in, in, in the work that is anti-racist work and, you know, from Black Panther to like other, other work that she's been doing. Um, but like really going to Egypt with this understanding that what Katarine said, like, how would you go in, into this place without thinking that this is their culture? Oh, it's very common for women to just live this life because that's how how it's been for them right but like also how to come to it with a lens that creates the possibility of like truly this idea of transnational feminism um so there is so much to learn about these spaces i i and i feel like also having to find out how we build this bridge between all of us in the diaspora doing this work speaking today in english um right like how do we also make sure that we keep building bridges as much as possible to what's unfolding inside Iran with 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 the movement. Um, for me, that's been like a constant question in my mind and the challenge of like, right, like how how do I make sure that this gap can constantly be, um, you know, find find ways to stay like connected in one way or another. And it's hard because again, we're not living in Iran, our day to day life, we're not like waking up to these experiences um, that you know, women or marginalized groups in Iran are, are living, right? Um, so that's also something that I feel like, you know, if anyone wants to add or mention anything about the examples that they've seen or the work that can be done to to build these like bridges, um, I would I would love to hear that as the final part of this. Um, thanks, Marish and Jan. Um, something that comes to my mind is, um, for some reason, I'm reminded of this narrative of, um, you know, th this is the dominant narrative, I think, in the past nine months that uh, we are trying to be the voice of Iranian people. And, um, and I always feel that our intentions are definitely well-meaning. But I also believe that it's important to kind of shift the focus um, towards something else. And I think I, I feel it is related um, to the question that you are um, asking. And something that comes to my mind is that I feel that we need to help people in communities that we are currently residing, you know, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, um, to really comprehend and understand them interconnectedness of their own struggle and the struggles of people in countries like Iran and Syria or Egypt, you know? And um, so you mentioned Angela Davis and this fight against, you know, racism and capitalism. And this is something that we are seeing in the global North. And I feel it should be recognized as connect as deeply intertwined, you know, with the patriarchy and the religious fundamentalism um, that today people in Iran are fighting against. So, you know, but this is this is a big image in my mind when you ask this kind of question. Definitely. Thank you for that. Katayan, I think you also share a lot of content on your social media. That's a big place where, you know, um, I personally have always learned um, from you and ways of thinking, um, especially I feel like when all of like there was there, there has been so much learning and growth for, for me, like personally from like many, many voices and like connecting things. And obviously we're all picking what makes sense to us and our ways of understanding, you know, our relationship to feminism or patriarchy, um, but I think you specifically like write a lot in Farsi on your on your social media and you um, have a following, you know, um, that I wanted to kind of like ask you about that experience. What 
What does that mean for you? Has it shifted? Do you feel like you've built like connections and new networks within, um, you know, um, the, the audiences that are connecting to you from, from Iran? Thank you for the question. I think we're all learning in this process. I've learned a lot during the revolution. It's a lot to learn there for all of us. And today also by listening to it, I have really been inspired. I've learned a lot. Um, it's, it's very hard for me to summarize and talk about how it has been because it has been a lot of ups and downs and um, a lot of confusion for, for me, for myself. So uh, with my contact with uh, at least women and, um, and the queer community in Iran, uh, the most horrible thing has been the things that I have heard is about their security. So it's very hard for them to network. Some of them really would like to be a part of like the collectives, like our collective here in Stockholm. But I have to all the time think about the security. They're all in tremendous danger and they're running a lot of risks. And also they don't have the infrastructure like talking to the people in Iran, it depends on the internet connection and uh, you can never trust that. So uh, that's one part of it. And another part is that because, as you said, we take what we what makes sense to us. So my followers are probably the ones that agree with me on at least 50 percent of what I write. And there are some people both in Iran and Sweden that we were, would hate what I write. So. And uh, with that, I mean that I don't know how representative my followers are of what is going on in Iran. But uh, I know that uh, for many of them, uh, the Jina revolution and just the slogan, as Aitak Jan uh, talked about, the slogan has been somehow emancipating and they have been somehow, as they say, they have been waking up by... <laughs> Uh, like a call from this slogan because it's so it's so big and it's so important and it's the first time that they find themselves in a slogan I mean women who have been uh, removed in the whole history they they are finding themselves in the slogan and that's so beautiful I think that and the queer community the trans community have also had this like instead of woman life freedom they have like trans life freedom and queer life freedom i think that's so beautiful and it's a very good way of showing how we are getting connected to each other so what i see and what i would uh say that that has been the best part of the revolution is the accounts the instagram accounts of the baluchi women for example if they're i mean they analyze things in a brilliant way, they both talk about patriarchy and how the central power has oppressed them. They deprive them of the right to their own language. Uh, the the Arab women, the, I mean, the, the nations inside Iran, there is a lot to learn from them. And I'm, I've been a little self-critical because I think we mentioned that we get our knowledge from from white women for them mostly uh, and we read the books but there is a lot of knowledge that is being generated inside Iran but we don't have the tools to somehow translate them to the world maybe not yet we there is a lot to learn from the movements in Iran and I think we have to we have to learn that ourselves first how can we transfer this knowledge to and uh, show it to the world sorry if i get long it was just about this instagram account and it's a lot to talk about there <laughs> no thank you so much that's such a good point definitely something i think about i feel like we need a whole just group to focus on how do we bring you know kind of again like build bridges between as you said what is happening much more in like a grassroots daily um 
And that's, you know, to me, the slogan, woman, life, freedom is a daily practice. That's also part of that, right? There are people living it every day and they are living it in places that they don't, they're not like having the, the opportunity to even like get online to talk about it, even in Farsi, or even to have an Instagram account, or even to have a good connection to internet in a way that they can share, or they're scared for their life to do that or their safety, right? So there is so many obstacles here. And honestly, sometimes I feel like, okay, how can I, you know, when I think about like the time I would spend in the in the village um, with my like father's family, like in Kurdistan and the learnings I would learn from like those women that are like very tangible, very simple, but are also very meaningful versus the theories we read, right? I feel like obviously we, I, I know we need the both worlds, but also that's the world that has been, you know, underrepresented, not, not, um, has not had the opportunity or the space to, you know, um, yeah, be, be, be presented or hurt. So that would be something I would love to eventually, like really just learn with all of you. Um, if there is no other, I feel like we can maybe like look at the audience uh, questions at this time, but I want to also ask Shukufejan if you wanted to add, or I tag John if you wanted to add anything else. Um, I think everything that everyone shared here was such a teaching moment for me as well, and I really want to appreciate all your comments. Um, I don't have much to add other than a few points that kind of when it, when when I was listening and I was also reflecting on that. Um, Washington, you mentioned Angela Davis, and I remember in November um, I attended the talk that Angela Davis and Gina Dent did for their new book on the uh, abolition feminist now, and, and I really appreciated the fact that they draw that connection between what was happening in Iran, and I thought saw that for the first time, kind of coming as a response to how can we grapple with what's happening in Iran. And I remember Gina then saying that what was hap what's happening in Iran is also an abolitionist feminist issue and needs to be taken seriously because we are talking about state-sponsored violence and you're talking about um, patriarchy entangled with um, kind of um, state and, and, and um, uh, disciplining of the state. Um, Another thing that I wanted to kind of uh, briefly point is the concept of the education. And I felt like, as you were saying, Katya and John and Shukufa John, it's such an important element of that raise, that raise of the consciousness, but also even inviting people to just kind of think about these issues as a conscious concept and vocabularies that I've yes, attended so many feminist gatherings and collectives and I'm part of them, but I still feel like the vocabularies that are being used when it comes to queer and um, when it comes to queer and trans communities are really violent and problematic. And part of, I think, one of the missions that I've identified for myself, but also like as a collective of people around me that we have been identified as actually to uh, just create workshops to kind of talk to people about like, what are some of like the, the ABC of um, queer and trans uh, communities of like the, the, the simplest thing of just saying, yes, we are human, honestly, like starting sometimes from that there. And um, and and yes, 100% holding conversation, Marsh and John, and talking about learning and teachings from women who might not identify themselves as feminists, who might not identify them as feminists, but they, they no survival skills and survival skills are not taught in the books often not I mean, some of them are but they are skills that are we learned from our grandmothers and and other people who did the labor of care and love for us and and their stories and their narratives and these are such an important places for us to learn that oftentimes get dismissed as as people who are illiterate who don't know what they're saying who've never been entered into any spaces that we consider like um, kind of legitimate teaching and educational spaces, right? And bringing, if we want this revolution to move on and if we want it to last longer, we kind of connect it back to what Shukufa Fajan said. We need to connect it, for example, look at what Chilean feminists said, did in the context of 2019 and 20, bringing the indigenous folks, bringing the voices of the local people and, and other women into conversation and, and, and thinking with them and not kind of like, top down of we need to educate you but rather we need to learn and unlearn together so thank you thanks so much to all of you there's so many dimensions so many 
so many ways to come to you know these conversations and I think that's what makes you know sometimes I feel like almost sometimes with these discussions we're all like also like brainstorming like together like thinking about things as someone says something something else kind of comes up that I have not like thought about before so and that's really for me the beauty of also having access to these moments with you all so thank you and with that chloe if you would like to open it to questions with um audience members thanks so much yeah firstly thank you so much to all of you for this amazing conversation um we do have a few very thought-provoking questions and so the first question i will ask on behalf of nasli in the audience um Thank you so much for this difficult and illuminating discussion. I'm thinking about how some of our grievances about lack of recognition and solidarity from communities and institutions we work for and with has resulted in getting institutional resources, which is necessary and wonderful. But it also feels that much of the labor of representation of the ongoing Jina revolution in Iran has fallen on the shoulders of Iranian women in diaspora. This is huge and ethically complex work that I personally grapple with. I appreciate it if the panelists can think with me on this question and speak a little bit on how you negotiate your own praxis and power as folks in the diaspora in relation to material conditions of the revolution in Iran. Thank you. Okay, I'm I'm trying to <laughs> think at the same time. Um, that that's such a such a complex question. I feel and talking about you know the material um, day to day life of of people is something that I really um, talk about, and I feel we need to talk more. You know, um, and it. In a way, it um, comes back to maybe the slogan um, and Morishinjan, you talked about woman life freedom is a daily practice. So I have I have that kind of you know narrative on my mind, and I'm thinking when we think about you know these material implications, you know, and um, it, it kind of goes back to day day to day material reality of people and um, women, especially going back, you know, to the genealogy of the um, the slogan and understand the struggles and hopes and um, the strategies of Kurdish, especially Kurdish women, uh, women's movement. Um, and yeah, I think you know there is this. There's also this conversation around hope, I feel, which is very important here. And um, we all need to go back to that. And I feel everyone today was talking about how much we learn about, how, how much we learn from Black movements and Black feminism. And I think that that's something that we can go back to again. Um, to learn from. And someone that I have in my mind is Mariam Kaba, um, who is a Black activist and educator. And um, she has this saying about hope being a discipline. You know, she talks about how we have this opportunity um, kind of at, at every moment, really, to push um, in a direction that we think we actually we actually can do something and there's actually a direction toward more justice, which I find very inspiring um, and very similar, you know, to the notion of woman life freedom is a daily practice. So I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure if I am really answering the question, but, you know, I feel this embracing a day and this daily work um, of challenging oppression and at the same time, cultivating hope and creating care, as um, Katayon talked a lot about um, today. I think within our communities here in diaspora, that's that's un something that we need to continue um, doing. Yeah.
Thank you so much for that answer, Shokufe. Um, we do have one more question today, and it's from Persis. Persis, I'm going to give you the chance to ask the group directly. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for your very um, important work and for the perspectives that I think are just invaluable to keeping both the struggle of women in Iran um, and the sort of ab larger abolition movements that it's driven by on our radar. Um, I'm going to ask something that's very specifically U.S. centric because I haven't seen as much conversation about the attack on women's bodies, literally like the overturning of Roe v. Wade is the most clear example that I can identify in the West of an attack on uh, women's autonomy, bodily autonomy. Um, and of course, following on the heels of that overturning of Roe v. Wade has been the passage of over 400 pieces of legislation attacking gay and trans people. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's either thoughts that you have about ways we can insert that as a moment of um, very clear connection and solidarity, because it's driven by the st same state-centered violence, uh, religious patriarchy, and a kind of fundamentalist agenda. Um, and I don't see it very much being uttered. And I just wonder if you have either, have either seen that or have thought about ways to bring that struggle into this conversation. I can quickly jump on that one. Um, thank you for that question, Persis. Um, I do, um, I feel like when we, when Katayun was talking about the fact that some white feminists that are saying our patriarchy is better than your patriarchy, right? That 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 kind of kind of distinction that oh yes, like yeah, we might be a little bit oppressed, but like you're so oppressed, like you're just, um, it, and it's totally different. And I think these examples give such an important ground for us to say no, actually. Um, the patriarchy that you're experiencing, uh, you're experiencing, yes, the context is absolutely different. And, and there should be an emphasis on the, 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 the differences. We're not going to say everything is the same and we all exactly experience everything the same. But to say that we all live under this heteronormative capitalist patriarchy, that is the, that is the truth. That is kind of the transnational connection between us that can build around that build our movement as a transnational feminist right to say that these structures although manifest differently in different contexts they're historically co-constituted there is a deep connection between queer phobia transphobia and violence against um let's say like gender-based violence right and and sexism that is very much implicated also in the imperialist mission in the region the way that the imperialist missions are justified for saving quote unquote other women or muslim women etc that is also deeply connected to capitalism which from the moment of its birth it actually has um a deep connection to gender division of labor and 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 social reproduction theory to put to create that division of saying some people are going to stay at home and take care of others for free and others are going to go and work on the, the factory floors, right? So for that, just bringing all that together and, and you asked like if you had an opportunity to talk about it. And I am um, in the classroom, I, I do lecture uh, on feminist theory. It's an introductory course. It's it's the first year course. Uh, it's one of the one of the courses that I teach. And I always, I always thought about how to kind of create this conversations um, around the sort of transnational solidarity that both acknowledges the difference, but also points at the connections that they have. And, and talk about, for example, the case of Iran without exceptionalizing it and making it look like that's the only place in the, in the world that these kind of sort of oppressions happen. Um, and I felt like talking, bringing history into conversation and looking at the histories of patriarchy, capitalism, imperialism, settler colonialism, and queer phobia and transphobia, which all kind of merge under the same umbrella of cis heteronormative oppression, 
how can how, how can talking about history and the moment that these things are created or at least the points that they've emerged can help us not exceptionalize it and also of course connect these issues together and say no actually your patriarchy is not better than mine um yeah thank you That was an amazing question, Persis. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all so much for this incredible conversation. Um, at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And I'm thrilled to welcome Persis Kareem to the stage for a reading. Persis Kareem is a poet, editor, and professor of comparative and world literature at San Francisco State University, where she also directs the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies. Her poetry has been has appeared in numerous national publications, including Callaloo, Read Magazine, The New York Times, Raven's Perch, Rowayat, as well as Essential Voices, Poetry of Iran and its Diaspora. She is the editor of three anthologies of Iranian diaspora literature and has written numerous articles about Iranian diaspora literature and culture. And with that, I'll pass it over to Persis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the Brooklyn Rail. Thank you to Morishin for this exciting conversation, to Aitak, Katayun, and Shokufe for all the work that you're doing in your respective spaces. I'm really honored to be with you all and have learned a great deal, and I look forward to keeping these conversations going. I'm going to read you two poems, um, one of which is a uh, a poem that I feel like I have to read because um, the people of Iran have been suffering for not just the last year, but uh, for over a century under um, regimes that I think have been brutal, uh, dictatorial, and anti-woman, anti-gay. Um, and I think a lot about all the losses that um, are not even acknowledged uh, in the sort of grand scope of Iran's history over the last hundred years in particular, as it's um, struggled to have some sense of democracy. Um, and I, in particular, I think about the parents of young people who've been imprisoned, tortured, and executed, um, not just in the last year, but over many decades. Uh, and this poem I dedicate to the people of Iran, but it's also a special shout out to Morashin because I think she's been doing some marvelous work uh, interrogating the ways that museums um, present narratives to us. So this is called the Museum of Loss. One day they will build an edifice on the hallowed ground where they fell. It will contain emblems of kindness, of memory, the lone rose her comrades threw down, the frozen shadow of a hand outstretched to pull her up after being struck by a soldier, or the blood stain of a street where a man took a bullet and his friends lifted him above their heads. And it will also hold the tear-drenched tissues of mothers whose children were taken, arrested, beaten, kidnapped, imprisoned, tortured, shot, and there will be tears of fathers collected in small clear bottles containing oceans of sorrow. And there will be letters to their children that begin with Azizaman, my dear beautiful daughter and prayers pressed against their lips sent out to the sky and worry beads worn thin by the grandfather awaiting his granddaughter's return, the letter from the court denying a trial or the formal charges of spying or treason for writing a poem of revolution or graffiti on the wall demanding revolution and freedom for women. And there will be photos too, the woman who was once a girl without a veil, the boy who kicked a soccer ball in the alley, the serious expression on a son's university ID card, and the man whose passport photo was left behind when he escaped across the border to Turkey and never saw his mother again after his exile in Norway. In the large gallery, there will be a room of hope that will show the sister's sign saying, enough, the brother's letter pleading for his sister's life, or the lawyer who tried to speak on behalf 
of her client, but was interrupted and in arrested herself. There will also be the dreams of the solitary too, the woman shut away in the small dark cell who kept herself company by reciting the quatrains of Hafez and Rumi that her father taught her to memorize, but could only recall by writing them in the air. There will be a room of the gifts made for their mothers that were never delivered, dolls made from foil candy wrappers, the drawing of a father to remember his face, pieces of old newspaper salvaged to make a collage to decorate the gray wall, the small notebook a father smuggled in where she saved sketches of women in black whose profiles she studied in the afternoon. There will be a special room of silence too, where the quiet passage of days was marked with a faint scratch on the floor or days without speaking to anyone the muteness of the needle she held in her hand to darn a hole in her pants with only enough thread for one knee. And it will also hold the green stillness of a tiny seedling of an apple wrapped in cloth and perched on the ledge of the window where a sliver of light found its way. It will be a museum for everyone. And then I'm gonna leave you with a more optimistic poem that I wrote right after the beginning of the Gina revolution called Lion Women. And for those of you who don't know, many of the early images of women rising up in September and October evoked the feeling of the bravery of lions and, and people were calling them Shirzan, lion women. For my sisters in Iran, they're coming now, the Shirzan, lion women whose tiger tongues break loose in the chorus of autumn night. Their manes blow free in the air after the long darkness belted under the tent of a timid animal, men in robes and white turbans who hide in the barricade of a book, gun masquerading as morality. They know nothing of this fierceness, of the refusal to be held prisoner in the basement of their perial dreams. They cannot quiet this storm of shapeshifters whose bodies and minds have stored the ancient hunger to be free. They will rise and fly. They will be sated. Woman, life, freedom. Jeanne, Jeanne, Azadi. Zan, Zendegi, Azadi. Thank you. Wow. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Persis. And thank you again to all of our speakers today. Thank you to Morishin and Aitak and Shokufe and um, to Katayun. And thank you as well to Melissa for their support in preparing for today's event. I'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art, who sponsor this program, our NSE, and make these daily conversations possible, and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events like this one, our daily NSE. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., you can join us for a conversation with Marin Hassinger and Jessica Holmes on the event of Process at Susan Inglet Gallery. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Sahar Romani. And as is rail tradition, you all can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for this for the reading. Thank Beautiful. Thank you all so much for the conversation. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you tired? Thank you so much, Katanyo. freedom. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yes. More power to you all for us all. Keep up the good work.